Good morning to everyone. Bienvenue. Um, I can see the future of the European Union. It's a little bit depopulated this morning. But I'm hoping everyone has been properly caffeinated and is ready to go for a very busy day. My name is Stephen Erlanger. I'm the New York Times Bureau Chief in London, um, formerly at different times in my life in Berlin and in Paris and in other places too. Um, but it's a great pleasure to be here with a very good panel to talk about something I think that's preoccupying all of us, um, which is the shock of Brexit and Trump and low growth and migration to the European Union, to its solidarity, to its um, sense of the future, to its sense of possibility, to European sense that they are part of a project that's taking them forward rather than ceaselessly back into the past. So we have a very fine panel with Elizabeth Guigou, a former French minister, um, and Norbert Rutgen, um, who's head of the foreign policy committee of the Bundestag. And I'm just going to ask them to pick out a couple things that in interest them to get us going, and then we'll have conversation and have some questions from you. So, Elizabeth, s'il vous plaît. Well, thank you very much. Good morning. Very happy to be here and congratulate Thierry again <laughs> for this very interesting organization. Um, very happy to be here with Norbert again. We meet very often, as you know, and we even had some Weimar trips and yep. uh, <laughs> we were in Kiev together and, then, and in Berlin very uh, not long ago and I will go back to Berlin next week too. I hope, I hope we have some controversy anyway. <laughs> well, you always have Kiev. Um, well, uh, Europe, uh, what's next? I think the main, uh, uh, the main challenge uh, has been for many years now uh, uh, to uh, rebuild the link between uh, the European Union and the European people. And this uh, is all the more important now after uh, the Brexit and after the election of uh, Donald Trump. But uh, uh, my opinion is that those two recent events, although they were a shock, maybe also an earthquake, uh, might very well be an opportunity to uh, strengthen Europe, provided European leaders have the courage and sufficient political will. As far as uh, Brexit is concerned, uh, well, first we have to respect the vote, of course. It's for the British people to decide. Uh, although we deplore it uh, and regret it profoundly. Uh, but uh, uh, what I, I think is that uh, um, Despite the enormous lies of Brexiters and the fact that they did not uh, assume the responsibilities, I think the only thing we have to do now is to have as uh, quickly as possible the exit negotiation started, certainly not later than by the end of March next year. Why? Because. Uh, it has to be, those negotiations will have to be completed before the European elections in June uh, 2019. Uh, secondly, I think that, uh, uh, I hope that these uh, discussions and negotiations will uh, reach the best cooperation possible. Uh, provided we don't uh, uh, we, we stick to the principles of the Union, which are, uh, which are of course, the uh, single market, the four freedoms, including uh, freedom of movement, 
and that uh, uh, we, we do not cave uh, any of the fundamentals of the Union. And uh, um, having said that, uh, we can very well imagine a specific status for uh, the UK, since uh, the uh, UK government said that they didn't fit with either the Norwegian model or the Swiss model. Uh, but of course, uh, with the idea, uh, not at the expense of, uh, of the Union. And up to now, uh, the 27 have uh, kept together on, uh, on such a line. And of course, uh, uh, it is very important to say that uh, among those principles, the uh, financial passport goes along with the financial with the single market. I was in London, um, well, last Sunday and Monday, and we had thorough discussions on that. It's obvious that it will be a very difficult uh, discussion. Uh, but, you know, it's for the British to decide. If they want to have some access and access to the single market, then uh, it is for, for them, like the Swiss and the uh, Norwegian, to uh, accept some of the rules. And finally, on the Brexit, I would say that France uh, will be very keen in enhancing its co bilateral cooperation, certainly uh, on defense, on migration, and of course, on uh, the status of the British citizens in France and the French citizens uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the UK. As far as the uh, US elections are, are concerned, of course, uh, the, the US is a major partner of France and of Europe, and we have to work with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Trump. Whatever the uh, uncertainties, uh, we have to work together because uh, uh, we have links on uh, economy, on security, on the Middle East, on, uh, in Africa, on the fight against uh, terrorism, and of course, last but not least, on the climate issue. But on all these issues, uh, we're expecting to know what Mr. Trump is uh, effectively going to do. And of course, we have some uh, worries, uh, especially on the climate change. I was in uh, Marrakech last, uh, when was that? Tuesday. <laughs> and I could see, even in hearing uh, John Kerry, how concerned and worried uh, he was. So uh, we'll have to discuss with Mr. Trump uh, what, uh, uh, what nuclear deal with Iran, what future for transatlantic negotiation, and what will be the U.S. policy towards Russia and towards China? Well, there are lots of threats, you know, uh, especially in the China Sea, and some of the words during the campaign were not uh, uh, reassuring on that. So uh, um, I think on those, those two events uh, uh, compel the Europeans really to do what they should have done for many years, which is to uh, strengthen their policies, not on all subjects, of course, Europe has not to deal with uh, everything, but on uh, subjects where transnational challenges are there, uh, we need to have uh, uh, a stronger Europe, and I hope that uh, the time has come, especially for Europe to have a uh, uh, um, an external policy, because one of the main flaws, we, we, we have strengthened our internal policies. I think the uh, Economic and Monetary Union is well uh, uh, on, on, on the good path uh, in strengthening itself. We have uh, common policies which, you know, uh, are okay, but we have never had uh, a common external policy, and we need that not only on uh, um, foreign affairs policy, not only to fight terrorism, but for migration and for the development of our neighbors, either in the East or in the South. So I think we have no other choice than to uh, unite uh, ourselves, and I hope it will be uh, possible.
Um, let me ask you one, one question here. I mean, Brexit um, was kind of a shock, and it seems to have led to lots of other shocks. Um, and these things have a, a momentum. But do you think for the European Union, this is a prise de conscience, a, a sort of wake-up call? Do you think it will sober people about the future of the European Union and bind it more? Or will it begin to spin it apart, do you think? Well, uh, I don't know. I hope it will be, as uh, Thierry said, uh, a wake-up call, of course. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it, uh, it depends on, uh, on the uh, common will of the leaders, which is uh, rather weak and has weakened. It depends on uh, their ability to explain to the European people that uh, you know, going inward, uh, building walls, is not a solution. That uh, since when we have transnational challenges, uh, we are bound to cooperate together and to deal in a transnational way and, uh, and to explain that in, in a global world, uh, which is a more and more uncertain world uh, and more unstable, uh, the only uh, uh, solutions are in, uh, in cooperation between, uh, uh, between the Europeans. And to explain maybe that, uh, uh, to, to, to give answers to the fears of the Europeans, if you, if you think, what are those fears today? They, uh, they express fears from the outside. And therefore, we've got to explain, we need to make understand that uh, uh, the only answer is to cooperate, to, uh, to give a, a positive response to that. So uh, I hope, but I'm not sure. No, that's right. It just seems to me it's really where you started, which is the reconnection of the European Union to Europeans themselves. And part of it's about listening. And bureaucrats aren't always very good at listening. They're quite good at telling. Um, Norbert, you're a politician too. Uh, the other part of the French-German couple here. Um, and um, over to you, please. OK. Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, what next in and for Europe is the question before I uh, try to elaborate a little bit on this question. Just let me perhaps briefly summarize where we are, and from that point we can ask how will it go on. Uh, I think where we are is uh, a point and situation we have not seen since World War II. There have not been so many crises at the same time from abroad and internally uh, in Europe and confronting Europe. Uh, externally, we have a fundamental new posturing of Russia, as everybody knows. This has shattered the European peace order. We considered to be eternal after the, the coming down of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain. Everybody thought and considered this European peace order to be the consequence, the historic consequence of the bloodshed of the 20th century. And we, we were absolutely sure, not that Russia is a democracy like the Western uh, European style of kind of democracy, but that Russia was absolutely determined to remain a part of that political order. And we have to be had to, to see that Russia violated not only a border, it's not only about not only about Ukraine, but it is about the persistence of the peace order in Europe. What we are dealing uh, with Russia uh, when we talk about Ukraine, and then we have seen the uh, increased turmoil, uh, the the territorial extension of the conflicts from Northern Africa over the Middle East, Iraq, Syria, to Afghanistan, and an increase of complexity, which also seems to be persistent. It's not 
going away anytime soon. And we see uh, a mixture between the Russian posture in uh, Europe and the military encroachment and activity in Syria by waging a war and committing war crimes. Uh, and what we see as Europeans for the first time, of course, the geography has not changed, uh, but the politics have changed. What we see is a fundamentally new quality of mobility of crises. The consequences of crisis now are spilling over to Europe. And we can't say any longer we have domestic politics and policies which can be separated from foreign policy crises. They are there, they always have been there, but they are far away. No, they are not any longer far away, but they are coming and entering Europe and having a huge impact on the stability of our societies. So problems which emerged to be and evolved to be foreign policy problems have roots in social, societal problems within foreign countries spilling over to Europe as foreign policy problems and, uh, uh, and, have, and affecting the stability of our societies. So we have, uh, we have not any longer the separation between foreign policy and domestic policy, but we are, do not also have any longer only interstate problems, but we have a mixture of social and foreign policy problems. And now, and then I will, of course, end with that description of the external challenges. We have uh, a new president-elect in the United States, and for the first time, perhaps in the history of American uh, foreign policy, at least for the last 100 years, uh, nobody in the world knows what foreign policy can we expect. Uh, at least nobody knows it. There have been some comments on foreign policy, but I think that it, they, were, it, they were not so much comments on foreign policy, but they were addressed exclusively to the domestic voter, uh, and, uh, it, and Trump did not care so much about that there were perhaps some foreign listeners when he talked about NATO and so on. So we have now even coming from the United States, uh, uh, a new portion, a new quality of insecurity which the United States now injects to the global insecurity we have. At this time, at this critical juncture of foreign policy surrounding Europe, we have unfortunately to state that Europe internally is in the worst shape since the Roman treaties. And it is the worst shape because it is not as it was and has been in the past, that you have a crisis, a challenge, and then you adapt. And after all, Europe emerged to be stronger than when we, uh, as we were when we entered the crisis. It is, a, it is a crisis of mentality, perhaps of political culture. It is the re-emergence of state egotism and partly nationalism not seen in the decades before, which fundamentally weakens us. So this may be perhaps uh, an un insufficient uh, uh, description of where we are. So how to respond to that? Of course, it is so complex and complicated, uh, it's not easily to be answered, but a, f a few elements of how to proceed in the interest of Europe and the West may be said. My first assumption is that in this ever deeper globalizing world without um, developing an international order, perhaps international order even in retreat, the West, the West as a political concept is indispensable. Either we persist to assert a, a Western concept of politics, which consists of fundamental principles and values, like the rule of law, like the dignity of man, like uh, um, uh, democracy. Either these values are asserted by the West or these minority values of the minority population, the West, 
will diminish and will not be asserted and remain strong. So the West is indispensable. Secondly, when it comes to a possible retreat and perhaps a new isolationism of, uh, of, of the United States, I, I do not predict because I remain to my point, we, we do not know what the American foreign policy is about. But America first sounds a little bit uh, like that. But I don't know. I don't, I don't assert to know anything about the future course. In any case, uh, in any case, what happens, the United States is irreplaceable for the West. Some say, yes, the United States might backtrack, then we have to come in as Europeans. Uh, given the political, economic, technolo technological, military power of the United States, there is no substitute for the United States uh, within the concept of the West. Thirdly, if we want to um, activate the West, perceive, preserve the West, the EU as one pillar, the second pillar in this concept, is insufficient, particularly on foreign policy. We have to evolve as an actor on foreign and security policy because even if Hillary Clinton had been elected at president, as president, of the United States, she would have been forced to focus on domestic challenges, on creating jobs, on, on bridging the societal and social gap in the society. And uh, so any uh, current and future president will have, to, have to, 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 to work on a very much domestic agenda. So on, on, in the interest, in our national interest as European nation states, we have to do more and we have to accept and, and face the reality that we are not any longer living in the Cold War where we had the security umbrella uh, of the United States, but we have to do more for our own security. And my last remark is, in order to enable us to do that, to overcome our internal dividing uh, um, differences is pivotal and a prerequisite that we get able to forge a kind of a common foreign policy on the European level. What do I mean with that? I think we have three dividing issues in Europe, the refugees, the economy, austerity, and Russia. And as a German politician, I want to make clear that I see that Germany with regard to these three issues has to shift from a partisan participant in the struggles into a new position as a provider for solution. Uh, we do not strive for the leading role. We haven't strived for that uh, and it's, it's not something we want to have and I would not assume as to be a healthy situation. But we have a political weight we can't ignore and we have to put in this weight for solution. We have to increase the legitimacy of result. This is a prerequisite for our overarching goal to unify Europe, to, to make Europe work again in order to, uh, to, 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 to uh, develop a, a European voice uh, in the field of foreign policy to serve our own fundamental interests. I think we have to Thank you for that very much. Um, I'm always intrigued. I mean, I think of Germany, you know, as, as they say about people, they may not seek greatness, but sometimes they have greatness thrust upon them. You may not want to lead, but there's no one else. So, so if someone's going to do it, you better do it. Um, this notion, which I think has some value, that Germany just wants to be a big Switzerland, just to kind of get under the eider down and do trade and not think about the world um, is becoming more hollow because as you've said very much, both of you, the crises of the rest of the world are coming home. Um, they're unavoidable. Now maybe the Middle East, you can blame Obama, you can blame everyone, but um, given where we are 
and um, we've talked about refugees, but we haven't talked about terrorism and, and Islam. Um, one tends to be a function of the other plus post-colonialism. And I'm curious how Elizabeth and then Norbert um, feel the European Union is dealing with these two associated problems, the domestic problems of integration and identity in France, but there are also um, domestic problems of integration for Germany, um, as well as being security issues about external borders and screening and how one copes with the other. Um, or, and also in, in a third sphere, talking about EU foreign policy, everyone, you, you know, it's easy to blame the Syrian civil war and the atrocities on many people, but I haven't seen the European Union doing much to help solve it myself. So if, if you might sort of talk a bit about these related issues, that would be great. Well, first I must say that, uh, because we, we've had those discussions with Norbert uh, all along those past years, I have observed, especially uh, since the Munich conference, was it in uh, 2014 maybe, or maybe the year before, that there was a will expressed by uh, the German officials that they should assume their international uh, responsibilities, not only on economics, but also on policy. Now, there has been progress on that. Uh, if you, uh, uh, the last meeting of our uh, defense ministers and foreign affairs minister last Monday, uh, we affirmed the common will to build a real uh, Europe of defense, which is of course complementary to NATO. There's no question about that. Uh, and this is the main challenge. What will uh, Mr. Trump uh, do towards uh, NATO, but we have to, and, and, and of course the summit that took place in Berlin between Mr. Obama and four or five uh, leaders have reasserted that. So <coughs> this is one main uh, focus. But it is true as well that there is still a long way to go for uh, Germany um, in this uh, uh, objective of uh, having uh, more contribution to a foreign uh, policy and defense policy. Uh, it's, uh, the, I, I see no uh, other way than working at more, uh, um, you know, more uh, coherent uh, policies between France and Germany because when you add the uh, economic strength of Germany and of course, the political and military influence of France, then you have something that uh, counts in uh, the United Nations, of course, uh, but also, as we see now, uh, although it's only, uh, you know, uh, a, a part of a coalition in the Middle East. So uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, we are somehow on the way, and I want to stress that the help of uh, Germany in Mali, for example, because we have not said a word about Africa, sub, sub, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, is one main challenge as far as fight against terrorism is concerned. And I will say uh, that since these questions are related to uh, memories of colonialism and of course, of, uh, in our internal uh, societies, that it seems to me that we, we have no choice as Europeans to take care of Africa, not in a colonial uh, spirit, of course, but to help investment and to do that, and it has begun, uh, especially with Qatar. <laughs> when you go to Morocco, it's very obvious, for example, but we have to help uh, investment so that we create, we help create jobs for all these youngsters who uh, don't have any jobs, even those who have made, uh, who have been to university. This is one main challenge everywhere in Africa, in North Africa and in sub, uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, what, you know, uh, 
of course, we, we tend to uh, see uh, all the, the threats, and they are enormous, of course, as uh, Norbert said. We have never had such a, uh, a cluster of crises, but um, I am not uh, over pessimistic because uh, I have been chairing the uh, uh, Annaline Foundation for uh, Cultural Dialogue for more than a year now, and it's a foundation that gathers 5,000 NGOs, all between Europe and uh, South, uh, 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 the south border of the Mediterranean, from Morocco to Turkey included. And we work with youngsters, mainly. And what they tell us in all our works and, and inquiries is that those, uh, that not only a huge majority, but the, the, uh, there is a unanimous uh, 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 will to share the values of humanity, which are not, of course, they, they, I will not say that there is a common, uh, 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 that we have a, a you know, the same way in looking at democracy, but they want the state of law, and they want those uh, values of humanity to be respected, and we have measured that since uh, uh, we have existed the, the last uh, 10 years, and if we, we, we need to address, you know, uh, the uh, youngsters uh, of uh, all countries to say to our uh, youngsters who come from uh, the South Mediterranean and from Africa and from Turkey, you have a specific, uh, uh, um, you have something, you know, to, uh, that, that we do not have because you, you have the, some kind of culture in your family history and there's a lot you can bring to uh, humanity and on the reverse. And one of the main challenge since we are bound to strengthen the control of our borders for security reasons, we are bound to do that, and we must do more about that. Uh, it's underway, of course, still a long way, but uh, one of the main challenge is uh, that at the same time, we must uh, find legal ways and legal paths for mobility. Because if Europe becomes, you know, a kind of fortress with walls everywhere, inside and uh, towards our neighbors and the south and the east, of course, then uh, it's not Europe anymore. Um, part of the problem of being an attractive soft power is people want to come. The power of attraction is very strong. Um, and so there's this kind of schizophrenia which you've just described, which is both Europe wants to be open to the world, but it also wants to screen the world. That's the nicest way of putting it, and only let in the bits of the world that Europe wants to let in. And that's going to be a very fascinating thing to watch because um, there are a lot of challenges, and too many challenges at once tire people. They tire them out. So Norbert, you have, Angela Merkel has just said she's going to run again for the fourth term. People describe her to me as tired already, as being more isolated than she's been. Um, she's obviously been wounded by her decision, which you, in your rather elegant way, criticized parts of, which was to have this welcoming culture without a lot of controls to start. Germany's clearly done a pretty good job since then of um, reestablishing a sense of Ordnung. Um, but does she have the domestic political space going into an, an election and, and the energy, do you think, to, do, to take this leadership role, particularly on issues of Islam and terrorism? Mm -hmm. if, if she could promise to come back to your earlier question, if she, if she could promise uh, the German electorate to be a big Switzerland, then the CDU would gain an absolute majority. <laughs> but unfortunately, we have been forced to make the experience that it is a contradiction in itself uh, to be Switzerland and big at the same time. 
So there is no big Switzerland, and Germany uh, does not have the option to, uh, to transmogrify into Switzerland. So we have made and were forced uh, to open up our eyes because also Germany turned a blind eye to the neighborhood, and we could have seen more, but we were fo forced to open up our eyes to a new reality we are facing. And it happened not when the refugees entered Italy. Then nobody else, including Germany, identified this refugee problem and crisis as a European crisis. And we did not wake up when there were terrorist attacks, something, something else uh, in Europe or in the United States. But the last years, uh, the last year, starting in 2015, uh, with the refugees entering Germany, one million we took uh, and, and, and have offered shelter and protection to them. At the same time, realizing that there are not only those who want to share our way of life, who want to share Western values, but at the same time, perhaps coming with them and among them, there are people who hate our values, who hate our way of life and want to destroy and kill us. This is a new reality we have to face. And it, is, it goes to the foundations of our societies. I'm not absolutely sure but I think there is some reason to say that, that that was what once was the social question in its implication for society and state building and political landscape in Europe in the 19th century will become the global question in the 21st century. And we will have debates and fights between those who say, no, there is an opportunity to be Switzerland. There is an opportunity to be an island, to cut off, to seek uh, your uh, uh, lot by cutting off uh, uh, this reality we do not have any responsibility for. And the others who say, we have no option then but to shape globalization. We have to face that. And for Germany, uh, and I would perhaps, uh, yes, at least for Germany, the decision to face this new reality, to take in refugees who are at our borders, to improve our border management, to go to the region, to visit Africa, because the new source of immigration, of course, is not the Middle East, but Africa. So face this reality as a European reality, not as a specific German reality, French reality. I think this is what really has been fundamentally decided, and it's, this is the very nature of the Chancellor to see that. And in that, she is determined to pursue this course, and she is absolutely convinced that it only can be a success if it turns to be a European position in facing a new reality, not a German position alone. And so she will seek for partners in shaping globalization as far as Europe is affected by globalization. And of course, as open societies, we are affected on the end of uh, on the, all of the, uh, on, on all of the, in the, 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 the big range of, 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 of globalization uh, challenges and opportunities, trade, migration, climate change, terrorism, we have to face it all and to give comprehensive, unified answers. And I think she will play a significant, she will remain at, uh, to play a significant co-leading role in tackling these issues. Um, I think everyone understands that we don't know what an American foreign policy is going to be because the president-elect doesn't know what it's going to be. Um, he doesn't have a foreign policy because he has never had a foreign policy, doesn't really know how to make one. Um, and 
One thing, though, is, is persistent through his career, um, which is a, a sense that America's allies are not paying their fair share. This is consistent, and I, I suspect something he believes deeply, not just in Europe, but in Asia also. Um, and you look at the wealth of the European Union, 500 million until Britain leaves people, um, um, and one wonders if he has a case. Germany, I think, I may be wrong, spends about 1.2, 1.3% of GDP on defense. Two, yeah, 1.2. 1 1.2, yeah. which is quite low in terms of NATO's ambitions. And the, is Germany prepared, actually, in response partly to Trump, but also in part responsibly, in response to NATO's urging to spend more, and can it spend more on equipment that could be collectively used, like air transport planes, um, refueling, or is this too politically difficult, do you think, right now? I'm, I'm biased because I, I, I consider this <coughs> to be a fair point, that Germany and others has to contribute more to collective security. Uh, we have been a beneficiary, particularly of American protection all over the decades of the Cold War. Now we have a different uh, geopolitical uh, situation and then it is fair that Germany as a economically successful nation uh, bears its fair share and our fair share, uh, not to mention uh, our political obligation out of NATO for more than 14 years now, 2002, we promised to deliver on the two-point GDP contribution to defense. Uh, we, we have to raise, to rise our, uh, uh, our level of responsibility. We have, we have, and on the, this is the one, one element. The, the second element is I think we will only do it in an effective way if we start to deliver on a second promise, and this is to bring together European capacities. So it does not make any sense that every European nation state starts to enhance contributions to defense, but, we, but doing it in a very, very economically ineffective way by, by multiplying our capacities and not pooling capacities. So we have also to start with that. So both challenges we have to start. The Chancellor has started, and this is a change in her language and rhetoric, has started to identify herself with the obligation to rise our level of engagement uh, uh, and including uh, uh, the financial contribution to defense. Uh, it is not really reflected in our budget planning. We will have an increase in numbers, but we are also expecting an, in, in, uh, an increase in our GDP, so that the increase in numbers does not lead to an increase in the percentage share of defense spending. So we will give some additional billions, but it will remain 1.2% of GDP. So this is not an honest deliverance on what we have promised. On both sides, I think, if we, if we want, it's a test case. It's a test case if we, as Europeans, really get serious on security and on defense, that we prove to be ready to pour money into that, which is the fundamental essence of state and this is providing security for our, uh, for our citizens. And the Chancellor has clearly been outspoken now for some time on that. And uh, she, I think she does not want to backtrack, but she is preparing that it's now getting serious on that. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth. As you know, uh, France is, uh, as far as the uh, defense budget is concerned, is nearing the 2%, not quite. Uh, 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 
the French president and the French prime minister have committed themselves to get to the 2% uh, in next year or in 2018. We've been increasing our budget uh, for obvious reasons, because we have to face more and more uh, uh, threats, of course. And, uh, and so uh, we'll see uh, what happens after the French election. But as far as we are concerned, we're committed to that, and we have taken decisions. Now, it's not, and, and the Americans are right in saying that we have not taken our parts of the burden, and they have been saying that for years and years, whatever uh, 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 president uh, was, uh, was speaking. Uh, second thing is, of course, what Nobel said about cooling the capacities is absolutely uh, essential because there is a lot of waste. Uh, but there's another, uh, there are two other main challenges for, uh, for Europe. First uh, is to uh, develop a strategic autonomy on the future technologies. And we have to invest on that. And there is a very uh, uh, precise uh, uh, decision to take is whether we allow uh, the European uh, institution to invest on those future uh, technologies, uh, what we call dual technologies, both uh, civil and military or not. This is uh, for the European Parliament to vote immediately and for the next uh, financial uh, plu pluriannual uh, budget. And the second challenge is the one of strategic autonomy of our defense industries. Because if we don't have a uh, European defense industry, we won't have a European defense. We will always be dependent uh, on you know, other states, and especially the United States. And therefore, uh, this is something you, we, we can't, we can't uh, take our part of the burden, having so much finance going to our uh, defense, and say, well, we are uh, dependent on what uh, is decided elsewhere, and especially in the United States, because we might very well not share uh, the choices, especially of Mr. Trump. Um, one thing that threads through a lot of conversations now is the new Russia. I, mean, I think we can overestimate the power of Russia. We can over overestimate the long-term strategy of Vladimir Putin. We might even overestimate the term in office of Vladimir Putin. Um, the country has issues um, of oligarchy and corruption and the economy is sinking one can't hide these things forever. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very struck, Elizabeth, um, there was the surprise, perhaps not to you, of the Fillon victory in the first round of the um, center-right primaries. And one doesn't want to assume, because lots can happen between now and then. Um, but um, it feels as if a center-right candidate is going to get into the second round. It's probably going to be Fillon. And people talk about um, Fillon and Putin having a sort of some kind of sympathy on values, um, on conservative values. And in Germany, of course, we've had a long discussion of Putin Versteyer and um, the strains among the German in industrial sector, but also in politics of how to approach this newly aggressive Russia. Uh, um, um, I remember in the Cold War days talking to a consul general of the American government in East Berlin at the East German em embassy, Hauptstadt der, um, der DDR, and he said, you know, the problem is Durbin's keep telling me, we understand the Russians and you Americans don't. And I always said to them, yes, you understand them so well, that's why they're on the goddamn Elba. Um, now those days are past, but maybe they're coming back again, at least in terms of this anxiety people 
have in the face of um, a Russia that is not happy with what you considered a permanent post-Cold War order, and which clearly is not. So I wanted to ask you both, you know, the future of Europe to some degree is about how it relates at least to Russia. Some yeah, people absolutely. want a new relationship, some people want a reset, some people say, oh, he can have Crimea, it doesn't matter. Some people say we need their energy anyway. Some people say the Americans are too far away to understand. You know, there's lots of views, but it actually matters again. So is, this is what I wanted to ask both of you in whatever order you feel like speaking. Yes, absolutely. I, I consider Russia to be the number one issue for European foreign policy. It's absolutely number one. And... Um, what we see is, to our surprise, that the concept of Euro Poland free is challenged and violated by President Putin. And uh, I think we have to be clear, particularly on that dimension of the challenge coming from Putin. I don't consider him to pursue policy out of strategy or strength. Right the opposite. It's, in my view, a policy out of weakness. And he has now tapped into a new source of strength, which is popularity. And this popularity comes from his new aggressive policy outside. He has managed to turn the public mood uh, stemming from, uh, got from the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, for which uh, Gorbachev is blamed in Russia, and then even being topped by Yeltsin. Uh, these figures, and since uh, this time, there had emerged a public mood of decline and humiliation. And Putin has managed to turn this uh, mood into the re-emergence of a new collective feeling of Russian greatness. We are back again. We are there. And we force the Americans to acknowledge that we are back on the global stage. And we give evidence that there is no single international crisis which can be solved without Russian contribution. I think this is the core reason for his military intervention in Syria, to create this crisis in order to prove even this crisis in that region can't be resolved by American strength alone. You are dependent on Russian contribution. So this concept, if we accept fundamentally to that, then we will, that this would uh, uh, entail an agreement that within Europe there is a kind of Russian influence zone and the countries within this influence zone do not have the sovereign right to decide upon the course of their country. If Ukraine decides normatively to join the West, not to join the EU, not to join NATO of course, but to decide in favor of democracy, rule of law, uh, and market-driven economy. Uh, and Russia sees that this would encroach into Russia and by that challenge Putin's power. He, and then he decides not to allow this way. And if we accept that Russia has the final say about the political cause of the countries within the influence zone, then we would have a new divide of the, of, the, of, the, of the continent in the 21st century. And this would, of course, spread across Europe uh, into other regions. It would be an example that not the power of right, the rule of law, but the power of might will be the ruling principle in the 21st century uh, and, and so this is a very, very fundamental question about European and international order. And the main spoiling factor in this 
for the, in our time and for some years ahead is Russian, un, Russia under uh, the reign of Vladimir Putin. He does not have a sustainable strategy for that. There is only one area where Russia is internationally competitive. This is the military. Of course, not the attractiveness, not the economy. It's rather the opposite because, I think at least, because Putin has come to the conclusion that modernization is in, in Russia is incompatible with his aim to stay in power. Absolutely the opposite to the Chinese way of combining uh, modernization and stay in power. Uh, he has chosen another way. And uh, we have to see this fundamental dimension and Western and European, but also Western unity in, uh, in, in, in our position to fundamentally not accept that is our strongest and most important asset. Thank you. Elizabeth, do you want to speak to this? Uh, with your permission, I will shift to French. You have these. <laughs> D'abord, uh, je, je crois uh, en effet que uh, l'immense popularité de M. Poutine en Russie vient du fait qu'il euh, a, euh, a eu comme objectif de réinsérer, de redonner à la Russie la fierté euh, d'elle-même et de surmonter l'humiliation terrible qui a été complètement sous-estimée par euh, les Européens et les Américains, l'humiliation terrible qui a été l'effondrement de l'Union soviétique. Et nous avons une grosse responsabilité là-dedans, nous, Européens. Parce que euh, quand euh, euh, l'Ukraine a fait sa révolution, quand il y a eu la guerre euh, en Géorgie, en, il y a eu un sommet de l'OTAN en 2008, dans lequel, en avril 2008, dans lequel nous avons dit, oui, euh, l'Ukraine et la Géorgie, ancienne république de l'Union soviétique, à ne pas confondre, évidemment, avec les, les États d'Europe centrale et orientale ou avec les pays des Balkans, où la Russie veut encore, j'étais en Albanie il y a quelques jours, veut encore avoir une influence. Ça n'a rien à voir. Donc, euh, quand on a dit l'Ukraine et la Géorgie ont vocation et nous les acceptons dans l'Alliance atlantique, ce qui est très différent de les accepter dans l'Union européenne, hein, à ce moment-là, nous avons offert un prétexte en or à M. Poutine pour euh, justement développer une attitude agressive. Je dis, alors, évidemment, on peut dire, oui, mais l'Ukraine et la Géorgie ont le droit de vouloir adhérer à l'Alliance atlantique, certainement, mais les membres de l'Alliance ont le droit et même le devoir de dire, attention, euh, nous sommes quand même sur un sujet géopolitique euh, absolument crucial. Alors, maintenant, on ne dit plus ça, heureusement, mais enfin, voyez, avril 2008 et puis août 2008, Poutine envahit la Géorgie quand même. Alors, qu'est-ce que nous devons faire vis-à-vis euh, -vis de, vis -vis de la Russie D'abord, M. Poutine est là, peut-être jusqu'en pour, pour des années encore, hein, euh, et, et la Russie est notre grand voisin. Donc, euh, nous devons absolument, évidemment, avoir un dialogue, et un dialogue intense et approfondi, ce qui, me semble-t-il, est le cas. Par exemple, ce que nous avons fait dans le, ce qu'on appelle le format Normandie, c'est-à-dire le président Hollande, la chancelière, avec M. Poutine et M. Porochenko sur l'Ukraine, ça reste aujourd'hui les accords de Minsk, le seul espoir pour la paix en Ukraine. Évidemment, c'est très fragile, évidemment, ce n'est pas respecté, mais malgré tout, ça existe. Et ni M. Porochenko, ni M. Poutine ne contestent formellement, en tout cas, euh, cette idée que c'est le seul espoir pour la paix. Euh, donc, euh, il faut être à la fois, il faut dialoguer, mais il faut être extrêmement ferme. Sur l'Ukraine, il ne peut pas être question, par exemple, ce que vous évoquiez, M. Fillon, moi je ne veux pas parler pour lui, je le connais assez bien, puisqu'il est membre de la commission des affaires étrangères que je préside à Paris, mais je connais ses idées. Mais euh, il faut bien entendu euh, parler à la Russie, mais en même temps sur l'Ukraine, euh, ne pas imaginer que euh, les Européens vont lever les sanctions qui ont été établis après l'invasion de la Crimée. Si nous faisons ça, 
euh, nous avons un problème majeur mondial, c'est-à-dire qu'on ouvre la porte, l'autorisation à n'importe quel État de modifier euh, ses frontières euh, au détriment, naturellement, euh, de n'importe lequel de ses voisins. Et j'ajoute que c'est aussi, euh, aussi un défi et, et un problème dans tout le Moyen-Orient, parce que vous voyez bien les tentations ici ou là de euh, diviser la Syrie entre... Bon. Donc, nous avons un problème de principe, là, qui est absolument euh, fondamental. Ce qui ne veut pas dire qu'on n'ait pas pour objectif de lever euh, les autres sanctions, celles qui ont été euh, établies après euh, les euh, problèmes euh, graves dans euh, le Donbass. Et, et nous avons raison de dire à M. Poutine, dès lors qu'il y a des progrès vers la paix, il y aura un espace pour lever ces sanctions. Ayant dit ça... Je pense que nous avons une, une, une responsabilité importante, nous, euh, Européens, membres de l'Union européenne, d'avoir enfin une politique vis-à-vis -vis de la Russie. Nous n'en avons pas. Euh, alors, et ça, ça, ça touche évidemment à l'énergie, à l'économie et naturellement aux questions. Alors, ça ne se bâtira pas du jour au lendemain, mais tout reste à faire. La deuxième chose et dernière chose que je voudrais dire, c'est que... Euh, euh, Monsieur Poutine s'est réinséré dans le jeu international avec, je partage l'analyse de Norbert, avec la, son intervention en Syrie. Euh, là, euh, nous avons, et il faut compter avec, euh, avec ce partenaire, naturellement. Mais euh, je veux dire aussi que Monsieur Poutine, qui a un sens aigu des rapports de force, eh bien, il s'est euh, aussi engouffré en Syrie, quand il a compris que M. Obama ne voulait pas intervenir contre l'utilisation d'armes chimiques, évidemment, euh, à l'évidence, utilisées euh, par le régime contre son propre peuple. À partir de ce moment-là, il y a un vide qui s'est créé. Et donc ça, c'est une question pour les États-Unis. M. Trump ne donne pas euh, le sentiment de vouloir être beaucoup plus interventionniste. Au contraire. Alors voilà. Euh, je ne pense pas que les Européens puissent avoir la capacité de le faire tout seuls. Donc, c'est un, un problème. Est-ce que nous euh, laissons faire hein, avec le risque immense, immense, de voir euh, dans cette partie du Proche et du Moyen-Orient euh, des États qui, malgré tout, maintenaient euh, une forme d'unité, qui, malgré tout, protégeaient des minorités, euh, complètement euh, imploser euh, Et je pense que si M. Poutine un de ses ressorts fondamentaux, quand même, aussi pour intervenir, euh, un autre, c'est qu'il se sent très menacé en Russie même par euh, le terrorisme islamiste radical. Et donc, euh, nous avons là aussi à coopérer, mais il n'y a pas, pas d'autre voie qu'un dialogue extrêmement ferme avec lui, mais un dialogue quand même. Merci pour cette réponse. Je pense que c'est toujours difficile de balancer balance satisfying Russia's need to have its dignity restored without giving away too much influence in territory. And that's going to be the dilemma, um, to take it seriously, but not take it so seriously that you surrender. That's the problem, <laughs> always. Um, the last topic before we go to some questions, um, The euro crisis isn't over. If you look at Portugal, their credit rating is really iffy. There's people talking about a new bailout of Portugal. Um, growth is weak in, in the eurozone. Um, Greece isn't finished. Um, It's not a very good time in Germany to start talking again about euro bonds and things like that. Um, and in, in France, obviously, there's a big challenge from the Front National, which is very anti-European, um, partly on the basis of the money, uh, the art days about the money, now about migrants. Are, are you worried? that there could be an, a new Eurozone crisis in the middle of all this? Um, it worries me. I'm just curious, very briefly, if, if it concerns you and if you expect one, or will it be suppressed as usual? For me, sir. Like.
Évidemment, une, une autre crise est toujours possible, bien sûr. Euh, et euh, spécialement parce que, comme vous l'avez souligné, euh, nous avons euh, une croissance mondiale qui ralentit. Euh, on l'a longtemps demandé à la Chine de ralentir son rythme de croissance. Maintenant qu'elle le fait, on a plutôt tendance à lui reprocher. Euh, et, mais c'est vrai, euh, vrai aussi partout. Donc ça, et spécialement, euh, l'Union européenne et plus encore la zone euro euh, a une croissance faible. Donc on a un enjeu majeur interne qui est euh, d'abord de renforcer l'union monétaire. Ça, ce n'est pas tout à fait terminé, puisque nous n'avons pas terminé l'union bancaire. Et euh, euh, bien qu'on ait bien avancé sur ce, sur ce chemin-là, enfin, euh, il reste encore beaucoup à faire sur l'union bancaire. On n'a toujours pas de garantie des dépôts. Et euh, on sait très bien que le fameux fonds euh, euh, de mutualisation ne sera créé que dans, que dans quelques années. Donc, euh, on a posé des principes qui sont très, très bons. Euh, on a commencé à mutualiser un certain nombre de, de risques, mais, mais pas tout à fait. Mais surtout, nous avons à construire une véritable union économique. Et là, c'est vrai que nous disons, nous, euh, chacun a à prendre sa part de responsabilité. Pour la France, à l'évidence, il faut continuer à maîtriser les déficits, ce qui est en train de se faire, puisque normalement, on devrait être dans les 3% de déficit euh, l'année prochaine, peut-être un tout petit peu au-dessus, mais enfin, on a quand même fait une diminution euh, considérable. On, a, on est en passe de rétablir l'équilibre des comptes sociaux. Euh, on a réussi à stabiliser la dette, pas encore à la diminuer, mais enfin, déjà, à la stabiliser par rapport à la tendance des dernières années. Euh, donc ça, et nous, av nous avons des réformes structurelles, par exemple la réforme du marché du travail avec la très controversée euh, loi euh, El Khomri, mais sur laquelle le, le gouvernement tient bon. Alors euh, ça, c'est un, un acquis pour le futur. J'espère que ce ne sera pas remis en cause si la majorité change. J'entends des propos inquiétants de ce point de vue-là, y compris de la part euh, de quelqu'un comme M. Juppé, qui ne m'avait pas donné euh, l'habitude. Euh, donc, donc voilà, alors là, il va falloir voir. Parce que euh, si, à nouveau, on reprend le cycle où la droite française laisse, euh, si elle gagne, laisse filer les déficits et puis c'est la gauche qui les, qui les diminue, vous pouvez regarder, depuis 20 ans, c'est comme ça. Donc, euh, là, il y a quand même un sujet euh, pour la future campagne électorale. Mais en dehors de ça, nous avons besoin de davantage de dynamisme pour la croissance. Et là, c'est quand même l'Allemagne que ça regarde aussi. Quand on a un excédent d'épargne dans l'Union européenne de 350 milliards d'euros et un excédent de balance extérieure qui tient à la balance commerciale de l'Allemagne, tant mieux, bravo, c'est formidable. Mais et enfin, on est dans une, dans une économie, dans une union économique en principe. Donc on ne peut pas négliger ça. Alors il ne s'agit pas de donner de l'argent comme ça à fond perdu. Il ne peut pas être question de ça. Il faut que tous les États membres de la zone euro respectent les disciplines. Mais il faut aussi qu'il y ait davantage d'investissements, davantage d'investissements en Allemagne, davantage d'investissements en Europe, euh, pour des, dans des domaines d'intérêt général. Sinon, euh, nous resterons dans, dans extrêmement vulnérables. Euh, et euh, je, je dois dire aussi que euh, nous serons vulnérables euh, financièrement, euh, économiquement et socialement, parce que euh, c'est un des grands... Euh, vous voyez, c'est quand même ça. Les adversaires de l'Europe, les adversaires de l'euro, aujourd'hui, disent, mais qu'est-ce que c'est euh, cette Europe qui ne nous euh, donne qu'une succession euh, d'austérité euh, Alors, il faut arriver à montrer que, dans cette coopération, avec un bon équilibre, comme on dit, entre la responsabilité des uns et la solidarité des autres, on arrive à avancer. Et euh, ça, ça reste largement euh, à faire, et nous avons là-dessus, euh, avec Norbert, des discussions euh, fréquentes. Yeah, what you do? Short, yes, OK. So once the, the euro crisis has remained to be fundamentally unresolved, We have not achieved a sufficient degree of economic convergence, and we are not even going in that direction. So the Eurozone has not achieved a sufficient degree of crisis resilience. The next crisis is, will, 
the next crisis will come, but we don't know when. If it is in the foreseeable future, the coincidence of crisis and the lack of crisis resilience will cause a will not only cause a euro crisis but a European crisis and at the center of this of course will be Germany to take a tough decision and uh, you ask for uh, for Italy or for imminent crisis of op possibilities we we have the referendum at 4th of December in Italy the polls hint to uh, expect uh, a, a no, and this will uh, inject insecurity, political insecurity, ensuing economic insecurity. It will perhaps uh, reveal uh, the partly bad shape of some Italian banks, and this could cause um, uh, because then the Cinque Stelle movement will be the third disruptive uh, uh, element in the year 2016. And I, I don't know anything about the future, but I think it, the, the, the present is, is so clear to analyze that you have to be worried about the outcome of a no and the ensuing consequences, both politically and economically. Um, thank you for that. I mean, we do have not much time, which is um, my fault, but I'd love to take a few questions from the audience, like one, one good round of um, questions, and um, then we'll come back to the panel. Madame Nardon. Um. Thank you, Steve. Um, is this working? Yes. I, it is. Um, je vais En français ou en anglais En français. Comme okay, vous voulez. Alors, vous, vous n'avez pas parlé pendant votre exposé, euh, ni les uns ni les autres, de l'accord euh, qui était en négociation jusqu'à récemment entre les, les États-Unis et l'Europe, le, le TTIP, TTIP. Euh, Est-ce que ce traité est mort à la suite de la demande de la France de l'interruption des négociations, à la suite de l'élection de M. Trump Et qu'est-ce que ça veut dire sur le concept de libre-échange Est-ce que l'Europe tourne le dos à ce concept euh, Ou est-ce qu'on peut euh, attendre mieux Merci. Merci. Uh, um, other... so... ouais, and, then, and, and then Miguel. Merci. J'aimerais poser une question et faire un, un rapprochement entre deux phénomènes qui me semblent en apparence totalement séparés, mais que l'on pourrait rapprocher. On est tous d'accord dans le débat depuis hier qu'il y a une certaine fragmentation des, des sociétés euh, sur les dernières élections, mais surtout un émiettement, euh, notamment de la pensée politique. Elle n'est plus produite par le, les espaces partisans. Et on se pose la question si les espaces partisans classiques ont toujours cette capacité de pouvoir d'encadrer les, les opinions. Et donc ça c'est clair que la question est posée. Par contre, et en apparence cela n'a absolument aucun rapport, mais je pose quand même la question, en face, dans l'espace voisin, il y a une fragmentation des sociétés due à des crises ouvertes. Je parle de la Libye, je parle du Soudan, je parle de tous ces, ces espaces-là. Et donc, euh, la première question, est-ce que ces deux fragmentations ne devraient pas euh, soulever un certain nombre de, de, de craintes Parce que cela pourrait vouloir dire que notre pensée politique, notamment chez mes amis européens, euh, développe certaines incapacités à appréhender l'intégralité de, de l'espace. Le deuxième un, aspect... Un, oui, oui. Elle une pourrait... question. Oui, okay. c'est la même question. Est-ce que par hasard, well then, well then les, 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 les politiques de développement qui appuient les politiques basées sur la minorité et non pas la réduction des grandes fractures sociales, quand on sait que toutes les crises ouvertes euh, en Libye, euh, c'est les fractures territoriales Benghazi, en Irak, c'est... Est-ce que l'Europe, 
qui ne donne que 2% à sa profondeur stratégique qui est l'Afrique en investissement, quand les États-Unis donnent 25% et que le Japon donne 26,7%, oui. est-ce qu'il n'y a pas une question de fond Merci. Merci, monsieur. Pour uh, Miguel. Voilà, je vais continuer en français. OK. Merci beaucoup. Euh, félicitations au panel. Euh, on est à l'heure de vérité de l'Europe. Euh, ils l'ont démontré. L'Europe a été visée dans ses structures des principes de réalité, que ce soit les outils économiques, toute la crise économique et financière, les éléments de liberté de mouvement avec les réfugiés et les migrations, c'est-à-dire Schengen, euh, finalement le, les accords de, de commerce avec cette négociation avec le Canada, le Brexit, bon, je sais que j'aime, comme ancien diplomate, j'aime toujours les références historiques. Et l'année prochaine, on aura le 60e anniversaire du traité de Rome. Et je sais que les pays européens sérieux sont en train de préparer une réponse. Est-ce que les deux commissions d'affaires étrangères, françaises et allemandes, vous êtes en train de préparer un document pour voir quelle Europe où on va se diriger Ça, c'est ma question. Parce okay, qu'on aimerait parfait. participer. Merci. Merci. Um, is there another... In, yes, the um, gentleman with his hand up in, in the Jalabad. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. My name is Abdullah Abdullah from the Qatar Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You mentioned that Trump's foreign policy is uncertain. And as you can see, Trump wants to improve the relations with Russia. So how do you see a strong American-Russian relationship as an effect on America's relationship with the European Union in the future? Thank you. That's a very, very good question. And uh, we'll just take one more way in the back. and 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 then go back to the panel for brief responses. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I have a question concerning the German defense figures. Uh, 2% should be uh, the, uh, the level that is needed for European defense concerning Germany. Uh, but uh, behind the 2%, there is some reality. Uh, Germany already expends about $34 billion a year, more than France, with 2% it would go up to 60 billion dollar a year, euro, pardon, 60 billion euro a year. So the, the consequence, Germany would dominate militarily in the European Union, and the uh, German export rate would also be much higher than it's already now. So would Europe could support it, this kind of situation? Is 2%, is this right. a good reality, is a good balance? Okay, thank you. Just, just to go back and answer what you like. Um, and um, Elizabeth, do you want to begin again? Okay. D'abord, la question sur le libre échange en France, en tout cas au Parlement français, nous, nous, nous sommes pour les traités de libre échange. Par exemple, nous avons approuvé l'accord avec le Canada. Bien qu'il y ait en France aussi pas mal de protestations sur cet accord, mais nous considérons que c'est un bon accord, un accord équilibré. En particulier parce que euh, le Canada euh, accepte euh, une instance de justice euh, euh, internationale publique et non de s'en remettre à l'arbitrage privé. Ce n'est pas le seul sujet, mais enfin c'est un sujet important. En revanche, euh, il nous semble, et c'est vrai que... Euh, on, la, ce que je peux voir à la Commission des affaires étrangères, on travaille beaucoup là-dessus, c'est quand même une majorité, y compris droite et gauche, confondue. En revanche, nous considérons que la façon dont ont été menées les discussions euh, avec les États-Unis sur le traité transatlantique euh, allait dans la très mauvaise direction, puisque l'Union européenne, avait, euh, qui négocie pour nous, avait établi des lignes rouges avec des intérêts défensifs, par exemple, ne pas céder sur nos normes phytosanitaires, sur euh, l'interdiction d'importer des, des poulets lavés au chlore, euh, sur euh, nos, nos exigences en matière de sécurité sanitaire. 
mais et des intérêts offensifs qui sont évidemment d'avoir un accès plus large au marché public aux états unis euh, à la fois au niveau fédéral et au niveau euh, local. Comme rien n'a bougé de notre point de vue sur ces éléments-là, nous avons considéré que dans ces conditions, euh, il n'est pas possible de continuer à, à négocier dans le vide, en quelque sorte. Mais ce n'est pas du tout, au contraire, euh, une, une, une restriction de principe. Quand les accords sont bons, euh, nous les approuvons. Sur, sur la question de, de l'espace, euh, très in, importante question, est-ce que les, les parties sont dépassées Oui, dans une certaine mesure, naturellement. Et c'est pour ça qu'il est très, très important dans notre, euh, nos, nos actions publiques, nous les politiques, nous les membres de partis, de, de euh, beaucoup plus associer la société civile et d'être en lien avec la société civile. Moi, j'ai toujours eu un engagement associatif euh, à côté. Je vous ai parlé de la fondation Annaline pour le dialogue des cultures tout à l'heure. C'est absolument essentiel parce qu'il y a des idées dans la société civile, parce qu'il y a des expressions, parce qu'il est important que euh, les peuples se sentent partie prenante des décisions euh, qui sont prises. Alors, je dirais aussi que je, je partage tout à fait votre remarque sur la nécessité de, de revoir nos politiques de développement et le partenariat que nous avons, nous, Européens, par exemple avec l'Afrique ou avec euh, l'Afrique du Nord, d'ailleurs, ou l'Afrique subsaharienne. Et vous avez très justement mentionné euh, l'importance des investissements que les États-Unis d'Amérique font dans leur sud et que le Japon ou la Chine, maintenant, de plus en plus, font dans, en, en Asie du Sud-Est pour voir que se créent des solidarités nord-sud et nous avons besoin, nous, Européens, de faire et d'aller évidemment dans cette voie, mais dans un esprit euh, complètement différent de celui de ce qu'a été le colonialisme, c'est-à-dire qu'il faut absolument accepter un vrai partenariat d'égal à égal, c'est-à-dire transférer de la valeur ajoutée, transférer des investissements, pas seulement faire du commerce, parce que euh, c'est bien le commerce, mais enfin, euh, mmh. les investissements, c'est mieux, parce que ça crée des emplois sur, sur place. On ne peut pas continuer à demander aux pays du Sud de simplement consommer ce que nous produisons. C'est d'ailleurs ce que l'Allemagne a fait avec les pays d'Europe centrale et orientale, hein, et c'est très, très bien. Donc, moi, je suis tout à fait euh, euh, là-dedans. Miguel Moratinos le sait, puisque nous militons ensemble dans les mêmes systèmes, justement, euh, pour, euh, pour, pour cette idée d'une d'une verticale, au fond, Europe-Méditerranée-Afrique ou Afrique-Méditerranée-Europe. Je crois que c'est très complémentaire euh, euh, de, de cela. Est-ce que, Miguel, est-ce que nos deux commissions des affaires étrangères ont envisagé de publier un document commun C'est une excellente question. Nous nous exprimons souvent de concert avec Norbert, mais je crois que peut-être nous pourrions essayer de rassembler nos positions, c'est vrai, ouais. euh, dans quelque chose d'écrit. Euh, ce serait très évidemment, euh, très évidemment très bien. With the brief remarks to the to the question, uh, with regard to 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 TTIP, um, uh, my personal view is that international trade and the trade agreement between Europe and the United States uh, is a major part of our effort to forge and develop rules-based systems. So it's it's not only about economy; it's about geopolitics and who is the who sets the rules and standards for a global order and for that ttip would be absolutely important uh, but i have to admit of course that ttip is a, a kind of this has has become a, a kind of this symbol of of all the anti movements it's anti americanism and we have newly also not only the traditional left wing, but also right wing anti-Americanism. It's anti-globalization. It's anti-capitalism. So it, it, it really attracts all the anti-movements in the West. And so we are on the defensive, uh, but I think we have to, to fight for it because it is uh, to, to develop rules for a world which is otherwise without rules and chaotic, or China is emerging as the rule setter, and this is not our interest. The fragmentation of societies in Europe and the fragmentation and disintegration 
of countries in the Middle East or in Northern Africa, like Libya, Iraq, Syria, and so on, at first glance, there seems to be no, 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 no uh, common, there seems to be nothing in common uh, with these phenomena of disintegration and fragmentation. I would only identify one perhaps important linking element, and this is the emergence of identity policy. Uh, over uh, everywhere in the Middle East and in, in Europe, we have identity policy as a new tool, perhaps also of power policy, and uh, so we have to be very aware of this element of the desire and the yearning for identity in a globalized world is very, very important. The Rome Treaty and the anniversary next year, I think we should make use of this anniversary, not only by not only celebrating the past, but having a view on what Europe has to do in our time to serve the interests of its peoples and of its citizens, and this is what European governments and politicians now really have to do to, in a way, relaunch the European uh, project for the decades before and take a measure on our predecessors. That's, that's the, probably a good place to end, okay. just because we've sort of run over okay. time. Excellent. I mean, if it's about identity politics, building a European identity would be a great thing. Um, I apologize for not managing my time very well, but um, I was enjoying myself. We had, a, to me, a wonderful conversation. I thank the panelists and hope um, you will all do the same. Thank you. Oops, I'm out.